Cue the music. Oh my god, wait. There's there's another person here. Holy, holy cow, how did... Who let, who let you in? Oh, right, maybe it was me. Anyway, it might have been. Alright, we're going to let the, uh, the viewers spool up here a little bit. We'll listen to our little theme song by our friend Paul Amelia, who has been here on our show in the past and talked about his music and his life with OCD and actually as well too. So Paul was a, a fun guest. We'll give it a we'll give it a couple of couple of moments here. Get everything going. It's the perfect theme song. Yeah. It's got vibes. It's good. Makes you want to dance a little bit. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Got your head check yet. Oh, we're getting a thumbs up on the dancing already from Laura. Oh. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. We like it. <laughs> oh, I see all the questions too. Can you see them? Yeah. They're oh, they're just gonna fly in all night there, Kimberly. So mm -hmm. we'll have some fun. We'll chat. We'll answer questions. So. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Once again, welcome everyone to our Wednesday night webinar. Our webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app that you can get through Google Play or iOS. And you can go to treatmyocd.com or nocd.com to check out NoCD and the teletherapy that we provide across the country. And now in Australia and, and uh, in the UK and Canada. So lots of stuff going on. We continue to work with getting more and more insurance coverage as well too for people so that their treatment can be affordable here throughout the U.S. as well. It is, it is a pleasure to have some macrame in the background tonight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and Kim, Kimberly Quinlan's here too, just so you know. <laughs> Kim, how are you? I'm good. It's lovely to see your face. Well, you too. You too. Thank you for thank you for being here tonight and and joining us on our on our Wednesday night. Wednesday night webinar. We really, really do appreciate it. Uh, you've got a book out recently. Uh, well, I, uh, maybe maybe we'll chat about that a little bit because boy, isn't that exciting to to talk about the fruits of the labor that that one puts into the book and uh, to to watch it grow. Oh my goodness! I've joined the author club, and I didn't realize it was such a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Writing a book is a big deal. Yes, it's a major pain in the butt. Is really what it is. Um, you I've know, never and, had such respect for authors as I do now. <laughs> now that you've now that you've done it, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, we're we're going to chat about that, and we're going to answer a bunch of questions too, and everything. But for for our listeners who who don't really know you, why don't you? What? I mean, I'm sure. Well, let me say, everybody knows who. <laughs> let me just say that. That was that was a dumb statement to you. No, <laughs> I'm I'm sure. So I my name is Kimberly Quinlan. I am a marriage and family therapist. I am an OCD and eating disorder specialist. Um, I am a friend of Patrick's. Goes on my resume. Um, I wrote a book. I wrote a book called The Self Compassion Workbook for OCD. Bum, 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 bum. And it is basically all the things I love in one book self compassion, mindfulness, OCD. It's like my career goals right there. So wow. I'm really happy to be here. Well, well be, we'll jump into questions in a bit because people. People then get antsy if we don't answer their question. Like, hey, answer my question. <laughs> but let's start off first with this concept, which I love, self-compassion. And and what does what does it does it mean to be compassionate toward oneself? And how do we do that when we have OCD, which is very uncompassionate? Uh, the last time I checked on it, which was about thirty seconds ago. So, um, how do how do we drive those two things together? Well. In my opinion, uh, self-compassion is the ultimate expo exposure for someone with OCD. Like mm. if you want to hit the highest on your hierarchy, it's going to be compassion because the voice of OCD is so mean and is such a bully sometimes that it can make us engage in a 
a compulsion we don't really talk about that often, which is self-punishment, right? Mm-hmm. There are lots of people do self-punishment compulsions. They beat themselves up for having the thoughts they have. They withdraw pleasure or self-care because of the compulsions that they have done. And so self-compassion can sometimes be the absolute number one best way to do exposures. But in a diff in, in addition to that, Self-compassion, number one, is ultimately treating yourself with the same kindness that you would treat somebody else if they were in your specific situation at this time. And so I would have everybody just consider for a second, if your loved one came to you and said, I'm having these really painful thoughts, intrusive thoughts, repetitive thoughts, I feel stuck doing compulsions. If they came to you and said that, I wonder what you might say to them, how you might lean in towards them and soften your eyes towards them. And maybe if it's appropriate to put your hand on their shoulder. Um, So self-compassion is treating yourself in exactly that way for going through what you're going through. Yeah, it reminds me when I was on your very fun podcast and we were talking about don't try harder try different and we talked about my concept of specialness which is yeah. uh, the rules of the world apply to me different than everyone else and and i would never treat anyone else the way i treat myself right and mm-hmm. and how unmotivating that truly becomes then because right. you, when you put yourself down as a way to motivate yourself it's really hard to be motivated yeah yeah. Well, in fact, we know it actually leads to reduction in motivation. So right. self-criticism is not a very good motivator at all. In fact, it increases the chances of procrastination. So. But but Kimberly Quinlan, if I don't remind myself of every dumb thing and I've ever done, I'm bound to make the mistake again, aren't I? So. Well, I mean, I think that that's based on our anxiety is usually trying to try and get, grab some uncertainty around probability. And so we'll do whatever we can to reduce that uncertainty and that probability. I think the main thing to sort of bring ourselves back to is humans make mistakes. The most compassionate thing you can do is to recalibrate your expectations on what humans should do and how we should be. And humans make mistakes. Um, humans have thoughts, humans have feelings, humans have mental illnesses. Um, it's no reason to beat ourselves up. But my OCD says I have to be better than all the other humans. Mm. Well, there is an opportunity for exposure, opposite (laughs) action, right? Okay, cool. OCD. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be so kind to myself today just to get in your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is... That has always been a favorite exposure of mine to to treat yourself today like you like yourself mm-hmm. and, and just sit with the discomfort that you're going to have with that because OCD is not going to like that because mm-hmm. OCD thinks it's got to bully you into behaving instead of treating you nicely into behaving any certain way. Right. And I going off that because you talked about acceptance was another thing you said and how you all all the things wrapped up in the book that you love acceptance. so there's an acceptance component in that of having to accept the fact that i'm a human and that i'm flawed and that i make mistakes and that i'm not perfect and that i'm going to goof things up Would, would you agree very much i think a part of the reason that we struggle with accepting in general is because we think in black and white thinking, right? If I accept it, well, therefore I must be bad and it must mean that I want bad things and so forth. And a part of compassion and mindfulness work is actually practicing staying in the gray or in the and so that, um, you know, two, two things can be experienced at the same time, right? That you can want what's well for you without engaging in a compulsion. You can have fear and still do the dishes you know, two opposing things can happen at the same time. So it, it's it's a lot to catch those that black and white thinking um, before we get too reactive. So acceptance, um, we can actually practice acceptance more when we're being compassionate, right? Um, if we are if we are making space for our discomfort, which is what self compassion is, it's sort of going instead of be wrestling with this feeling, I'm going to be tender with it. That can actually make acceptance much easier because no one loves acceptance. 
It's not yeah. fun. No, no. <laughs> I, who wants to accept a flaw? Raise your hand now. Exactly. <laughs> you know I mean? exactly. Uh, it's painful. It, it is. But but how how important it is at the very same time as well, too. Yeah. Um, and and you know, for us therapists, we work on this as well, too, because we are not immune from intrusive thoughts. But in, in fact, I joke with people sometimes that I, I feel like I have more intrusive thoughts than most people I've ever met, because after treating OCD for 22 years, you just absorb all of them. <laughs> so I, I can't do a thing in my life without thinking, oh, I could kill that person. I could it's run that like, person over. I could slap that kid in the head. I could, you know. It's like an earworm, right? <laughs> yeah, Once yeah, you get totally. stuck in your head. Yeah. yeah. If if any of you are ever in a conference and, and Kimberly and I are there and you see us walking down the stairs together, I guarantee both of us will think about pushing the other one down <laughs> the stairs while we are walking down the stairs with each it's other. We, those it's thoughts true. will come in both of our heads probably at the exact same time. <laughs> and we still haven't pushed each other down the stairs as of yet. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll I'll share when I wrote the book, one of the most anxiety provoking parts was I had a client at the time who was afraid that he or she would say uh, offensive thing out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I was writing the book, I had so many intrusive thoughts that I would put an offensive word in the in the book and it wouldn't be picked up. And so as I was going, I was just observing this this thought that kept showing up, like, what if you put that word in? What if you put that word in? Mm-hmm. Not fun. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, if you ask our friend John Hirschfield, there is uh, there's a typo in one of his books that's rather funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm just waiting for someone, but I don't think you can beat that one. I don't no, that one is pretty awesome. <laughs> that, is, that is for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, these these things happen, right? I mean, it's it's the card I have in my wallet for 17 years that says, "I hope my parents die tonight." That is still in my wallet mm-hmm. and, and goes I with remember. me, yeah, where I go, right? Uh, and to be okay with the fact that that's there, and to know that that card has no power unless I give it mm-hmm. power. But mm-hmm. if I give it nothing, it it gives nothing back to me whatsoever. Right. 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 <laughs> What do you see as a fellow therapist in the OCD world? What do you see as being some of the biggest challenges for your patients to accept? Obviously, the the compassion piece, the acceptance, but like, do you do you find that there are plateaus or points where people sometimes get stuck in it, and it takes them a little bit of time? to move to the next level? Where, where do you see the, some of those stuck points being sometimes? I would say the most painful stuck point that I've seen is people really struggling when feelings and thoughts feel very real. Yeah. Right? The, mm-hmm. the realness of it seems to be one of the hardest pieces to fathom because in their mind, it's real. Like, they really did do something wrong or that yeah. really there really is a chance they're going to lose control and yeah. that realness can be really really painful and i found a lot of people will punish themselves because of that realness that they feel in association to the intrusive thought yeah um the other i would say is just the basic stigma um of of intrusive thoughts and feelings and sensations and like arousal and things like that, urges that people have. And so shame, in my opinion, anxiety and shame are kind of neck and neck for what's the most uncomfortable feeling to feel. Um, A lot of people will say, no, it's anxiety number one, but I have seen a lot of people really avoid so much in their life because they don't want to feel shame. Yeah. Um, and so that's a huge piece of the work I try and do is catch where a lot of avoidance is happening because no one wants to feel shame. I, I've i said since the DSM definition has really evolved over time that it misses something because it talks about anxiety and stress and it doesn't mention shame and guilt and disgust and any other really uncomfortable feeling. And I think it does OCD a disservice in the definition as it stands by just talking about people feeling anxious because it's so much more than that. There are so many more feelings to have. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and shame wrestles with our identity and things that, you know, feel so large in the moment. So yeah, those are really big ones that I see a lot of. I mean, I could tell, we could talk a whole night on the main roadblocks, but those are like the, the ones where I really see pe people who are really ready to do the work and really want to get better. And they're just yeah. that's such a roadblock. Well, I love the first one you said, the real thing, because that comes up every single week in the, in the uh, feed, in the questions. Why does it feel so real? And my standard response is always because it has to or else it wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Imagine a non-real feeling in OCD. You'd be like, oh, okay. No. <laughs> you know, it just right. it yeah. it has to trigger that feeling of realness, or yeah. else we Kimberly and I don't have jobs if that's exactly. the case. You know, you you wouldn't need us whatsoever yeah. if if that's how it worked. So right, right. And I always say it feels real, but it's not true, right? Like yes. Yes. to to be able uh, the 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 recovery involves being able to stand back and observe the realness without getting in caught up in the content of the realness, which mm -hmm. is to go, okay, it feels real, but what would happen if I didn't respond to it as if it was the truth? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And how hard that is to sit in discomfort. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I, I think we sometimes ask people to do the most difficult thing that they've ever been asked to do, which is to sit in discomfort. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't agree more. And and it's something that I will be open and say, like, I'm still working on it, right? Like, there's so many times where I'm up to do something, to avoid something, and I'm like, no, no, sit back mm -hmm. down, sit back down. Um, and so I think it's it's a human thing, but for, for the OCD folks, for the eating disorder folks, it's, it's the biggest challenge worth celebrating if you're doing it. Yeah. Well, before we get in the feed, tell us just a little, how did you get into the OCD world and what, what brought you to this point in your career? I think people would be interested in knowing. Sure. So um, I personally do not have OCD. I have, I had an eating disorder and generalized anxiety. Um, when I went and did my internship, I wanted to specialize in anxiety. And I, um, the, the best internship I could get was at an OCD center. And the minute I learned about OCD, I was like, these are my people. Right? <laughs> Even though I did not have an eating, I did not have OCD, my eating disorder felt very much like the OC cycle. I had a fear, an obsession. It felt uncomfortable. I tried to solve it, figure it out, make it go away. Um, avoid it. And then I was stuck in this cycle of just hell. And so for me, I just fell in love with the work. Um, immediately, as I was still getting early in recovery and practicing mindfulness and self-compassion, I started to see my patients suffer with those same things. And was just basically trial and error, like what's working, what's not, applying what was working for me, even though I was having handling different disorders. And from there, um, uh, my my whole mission is to provide psychoeducation, but ho hopefully teach everybody how to be kinder to themselves. If mm -hmm. we can do that, I will be so happy. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice to have a little kinder world, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I agree, it, it first sometimes comes down to being nice to yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. I, In the teeny tiniest ways. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like, I love myself. Like right. it doesn't, it's not going to be like that. It might be just a gentle word or a moment where you just be with yourself or you say something kind or you put your hand on your chest. It, it can be very minute but make a big big difference in recovery yeah and on the therapist side how difficult that is for us sometimes too to take a moment for ourselves because it it it, it can be so pulling to want to help everybody else and we as therapists have to make sure that we're in a good headspace too to be helpful to everybody else yeah yeah I am still learning this one. I will be still learning this till the day I die. I have to keep <laughs> reminding myself I'm neither a good therapist or a bad therapist. I am a therapist. Yeah. 
Right. Like that, I have to keep reminding myself of that because it, it's so easy to get caught up in like, oh, look at me, I'm a good therapist. But then on the days you're not the best, then you're like, I'm the worst, I'm the worst therapist. So it's mm -hmm. staying in in that middle ground, I am a therapist. Yeah. Well, before we get to some uh, of our feed and we'll come back to discussing a few things with the book, I'd like to kind of talk about some chapters and what you did. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, this is the No CD podcast, No CD brought to you uh, today, and you can get No CD downloaded on Google Play or iOS. Join our app, our community, lots of education that we do. We do webinars like this almost nightly. We have tons of support groups available to people that are free, so check those out as well, and teletherapy available in the U.S. and outside side of the US as well. You know, one question that that I'll read from Morgan says, and, and I think this goes along in some ways with what we were describing. What's the best way to look at doing ERP? A war against OCD? Some say not to view it as a battle against oneself. Hmm. Well, you might, I'd be curious to know what your opinion on these is. So I have two I'd be happy answers. To give you my <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I'll, I'll give you my opinion on it too. Yeah. <laughs> I have two answers to this is mm -hmm. when OCD is like really loud, I tend to get loud with it, right? Sometimes yeah. you got to pull your shoulders back and get up in its face and be like, back off, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there is a time and a place for really like you're talking about, like sometimes getting a little aggressive and, 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 um, you know, holding your ground. That's what I would consider setting strong boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I would say at other times, the like I said, the most amazing exposure you can do is to be tender to the voice and say, thank you for showing up. And I see that you're trying to protect me. I see your agenda is kind and good. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a, you can't show up as one or the other all the time. If you show up in beast mode, you're going to exhaust yourself. Um, but there will be times where you do have to show up and pull your shoulders back. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I've, when you think about it in the war aspect, uh, OCD has never lost a war. OCD is a hundred percent winner of wars. So I've used the example recently of Charlie Brown and Lucy with Lucy holding the football. Every time Charlie Brown goes to kick the football, Lucy picks the football up and Charlie Brown goes flying through the air and lands on his back and is like, oh, dang, why did, why did I do that? And OCD is Lucy holding the football. And if you're Charlie Brown, you actually don't have to go kick it just because she's holding it. Because you know, no matter what, and Charles Schultz in an interview even said this, no matter what, Lucy was always going to pick up the football and Charlie Brown was never in, no matter how long he did the comic strip for, Charlie Brown was never going to kick the football. And OCD is just like that. You're, you're never going to do it just right enough for me to be satisfied and for everything to go okay. So now you have a choice. Do I go fight the war? and try to kick the football and see if I can beat OCD only to lose again? Or do I choose just because the football's there doesn't mean I have to do anything about it and I'm gonna go walk the other way and live my life. Now that doesn't mean avoidance and that doesn't mean distraction. That means I'm gonna live my life even though that temptation's there. I'm still gonna go and do the things that I need to do and not let that be a part of it. Well, you use the magic word and, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll do it and go live my life. Mm -hmm. I'll be yeah. uncomfortable and go do my mm -hmm. thing. Exactly. Tell me more about that, because I'm assuming that's in the book a lot, too, where you're talking about the and piece of it. So how have you kind of brought that about? I really I really like that, that concept. Tell us more. Well, about it. It's funny, because when I proposed this book, um, my biggest concern was that people would see compassion as another compulsion. Oh, I'll just let okay. myself off the hook and it's fine. I'll just treat myself so kindly and I don't, I'll just do the compulsion. And so right off the bat, I really clearly say compassion is not unicorns and it's not rainbows, right? Um, it is not that, right? You know, unicorns do fart rainbows. I don't know if you do that or not, but that's, that's, that's how it it's works. Yeah. So. Self-compassion is a unknown version of badassery that we haven't talked about enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, and compassion, uh, we talk about and, but I also talk about the word while, right? 
is you do what you do is you practice compassion while you do exposures. You practice compassion while you do exposure and response prevention, reduction, reduction of compulsions. You practice self-compassion while you anticipate the thing you're going to do that's scary. And so it's it's something that you take with you. Um, it like I said, compassion is often misunderstood as this, like, oh. And we're just going to be so gentle, which is good. We need that to to bounce off how mean we can be to ourselves and how mean the voice of OCD is. But sometimes self-compassion is saying, "Mm -mm, I'm not doing that right now. I'm going to actually be uncomfortable. I'm going to allow this while I allow it. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be nurturing. I'm going to treat myself how I would treat anybody else. And so while and and are very big words for me. Kimberly, can I do that though? Even though I have a memory that that I think is true, but I I can't guarantee it, of maybe doing something that might have been awful and horrible. How how do I how do I do that? How do I treat myself nicely? with the thought that I might have done something horrible. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first step is do it, practice first observing judgment. So it can work, it can happen in steps, right? Some people find this out and they're like, oh my gosh, that's the missing link of my OCD. And and they're off and running. I remember once doing a, um, a, a retreat for people with OCD and as we went to do this, I had a client a client get up and leave. She was like, call me when it's done. I'm not mm-hmm. doing this. Like, I will not allow it, right? Mm-hmm. And so the first step, as I said, is I want you to come in. I don't want you to do it. I just want you to listen. And I just want you to observe how your OCD creates these calculations or equations where you're not deserving. And that would be what I would say to everyone here today. Sit down and what is the equation? It's you plus intrusive thoughts make you not deserving. Like often people will say, well, if I broke my leg, well, then I would be deserving. But if I have an intrusive thought, then I'm not observing. uh, I'm not deserving, right? Mm -hmm. Um, If I had arousal or a feeling of like I actually did a memory, not that's that's not a memory of a good thing is fine, but not a bad, not a bad memory. So I think the first step is just observing equations. We have a whole section in the book, like understand your equation and be ready for it because nice. different people have different equations. And so in, there's a whole page. The, the editor was like, can we cut this out? And I'm like, we cannot cut this out. It was me plus intrusive thoughts equals deserving of love and compassion. Me plus thoughts and feelings. <laughs> like, and I say it over and over and over again. And they were like, could we condense it? And I'm like, no, no. it must be in there. Me plus urges to harm my, my people equals me being deserving of love and compassion. Like, and so I think that that's the first piece. Um, every, in the book, I'll tell you one of the main concepts. So, um, and some of you may have heard me talk about this on the podcast. When my son was in kindergarten, he got this piece of cardboard and it was called a clip chart. And there was a peg in the middle of the clip chart. If he did something good, he got to clip up. If he did something not so good, he clipped down. At the bottom of the clip chart was a call to your parents by the principal. And you don't want to clip down that many times, right? But if you do good things, you clip up. And if you clip up, you get a toy. Now, this is good for six-year-olds. It's motivating. It helps them not to push their friend, Danny, and it helps them to put their lunchbox away. But we as a young adults or teens or adults, we took take this into adulthood that I have to, I'm only deserving if I clip up. If I do a compulsion or I have a heinous thought, that's clipping down. I'm less deserving. And so the whole thing is you throw the whole thing out because you're always at the top. Right. And so I think it's first recognizing that thoughts don't disqualify you. Right. Now, how you said how, and I'm sorry, it took me a bit to get there. But the how is 
observing criticism, and then changing a behavior. This is actually a behavioral therapy, which is what do I need in this moment? It's the self-compassion question. I want everyone to think of that question. In that moment of discomfort or suffering, check in on what do I need? Most of the time, it's a hug. It's a minute to take a breath. It's, you know, it's to slow, just drop your shoulders a little. It's to say, wow, this is really, really hard for me. And so if you can check in with what do I need right now, that can give you all the information you need. Yeah. Long answer. Sorry. No, no. I, I wrote a book about it. You, wrote, you I mean, you did write a book about it. So therefore, you know, you're allowed for long answer on, on such a thing. Thanks for the, uh, the cliff notes there. Um, and I can, I can just see how difficult that is because you know one of the things that comes through here on on the feed as i'm scrolling as we're chatting you know this 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 false memory kind of experience right and and the idea that i how can i live with myself not knowing 100 percent if i did or didn't do something and again i think your equation applies there right it's the equations in the clip charts always it's always, um, and it's some, and like I said, it's so just helpful to know what your own equations are so you can be aware of them, right? Yeah. Just like with OCD, it's, it's, it's helpful to know OCD's tricks. And once you get to know its tricks, you're less likely to engage in them. Um, I think that this, the thing I want always to remind people is your self-compassion practice needs to have self-compassion too. You're not going to be great at this. I'm not great at this. Um, and so it's important that we give ourselves, again, reduce our expectations and give ourselves permission to make the babyest steps in this direction, right? If you can just do it like with one little thought once, I like get so excited with my patients if they say they did it once. Mm -hmm. And so I would really make sure that you're, um, being gentle with yourself as you begin to approach this. Because a lot of people come in and they're like, I'm so terrible. I suck at this. I suck at self-compassion. I'm like, you could be compassionate about your self-compassion practice. Yeah. OCD sure looks at it as a slippery slope though, right? One, <laughs> one add a boy to yourself means you're accepting of anything and everything. And mm -hmm. that's just not right. Right. Mm. And, and that's why for some, like I said, some people grasp this and they're like, okay, this makes sense to me. This is the missing link. For other people who where OCD does play that trick tricks with them is I would really basically put it on your hierarchy as an exposure and some and, and use it that way. So at, when you're having that thought, the exposure, you could read a script, you could write a script, you could do an exposure, or you could do some kind of self-compassion practice as an exposure as well. Because um, OCD doesn't tend to, that, that tends to make it want to throw a little tantrum, just like when you do response prevention, right? So yeah, if, if it's really that triggering, you could simply use it as a, an exercise of, of exposure. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is so hard for people to take that first step though, right? To, to give up uh, from the thing that is screaming in their head saying, it is because of me that you have not become a monster, a murderer, a pedophile, a rapist, uh, what, throw in the worst case scenario thing that you could have there. And it is only because of me and the constant reminders to you that I give you that you are on the verge of this unless you do everything I tell you to do. And only then will you be fine and will everything will be okay. Mm. Yeah. And the See, lie that that is. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, we could actually take step back from self-compassion and really highlight ERP here, which is sometimes if I've had, I've had some really well-known people in the OCD community say it, it was just not for me. Right. And, so, and I had said to them, maybe instead of self-compassion, that's a step down the road is just start with respect. 
Mm-hmm. Self-respect is, is sometimes a great stepping stone is just to, again, sort of, where do I want, where am I want to, if I did an analysis of my day, how is the criticism working for me? What are the consequences? How is it benefiting me? We may do a cost, uh, a cost benefit analysis and look at like, is it working? You know, is it actually keeping OCD in a little cycle here? And then um, if not, don't worry about it when OCD is at its worst practice it like you would during the day when things aren't so hard in other areas of your life because the neuroplasticity there can have a huge effect do it while you are making lunches for yourself or your children do it while you know be gentle with yourself when you you know trying to get the cling wrap out and it won't come out and you want to like throw it against the wall you're like ah I'm so glad at this and you're like this is a really great opportunity so practicing it at times that aren't around your OCD can just get the mind going and like all right that's how that works okay that's cool so it again it doesn't have to be huge and and one of the things in the feed is kind of leading what we're talking about to this someone said but not not a false memory OCD, but someone said, I did something bad once. How can I be compassionate to myself? And my quick answer before you, I would just say is not a human being in the world hasn't done something bad at some point in time, which means none of us should be compassionate toward ourselves or anybody else. And all we should do all day long is put ourselves and everybody else down, which sounds like a horrible, miserable existence to me. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Again, I I usually sit down and and do a I really have done this so many times in my life because I too am very human and I tend to be a mistake maker myself right because of my humanness is to actually sit down and go okay thing done right I did it I did it on this date it wasn't great but I hurt some people and so forth and then I go to look at the calendar for today and I go how can I be the best me based on my values yep. and does beating myself up have to be a part of that equation? Yep. How do, if I were to really live according to my values, do, do I need and require that, that criticism and punishment mm-hmm. to get me there? And this is sort of feels strange, but what would happen? Would I actually get more of what I want and to how to make the world a better place? Would I get more of that if I actually motivated using compassion. So here's the thing is there is a mean coach in your mind and a kind coach. The mean Mm -hmm. coach is like, get down and give me 20 and you better do it or you'll have to do 15 more, right? And it's like, you dumb, whatever, using all the language. Bring it back into bring it (laughs) back. The kind coach can get you to do exactly the same thing by going, you know what? Here is one of your strengths. Why don't you use that strength and let's do it together. Okay, you did the first step. Good job. Keep going. All right, you did one push up. You okay? Good job. Do another one. Both can get the same outcome. In fact, we actually have research to show that a kind coach gets way more have better outcomes. Mm-hmm. But if, if, what do you want in life? And do you need the voice to get you there? Yeah, uh, I don't do much. Well, I've worked with people in sports. I I myself am not a huge sports person, but I've worked a lot with people who are in sports. And I know that if you're in a hitting slump, it is best to watch film of when you were hitting well and trying to emulate that than it is to watch film of yourself missing and trying to figure out what you've been doing wrong. In fact, if you injure yourself, they actually use imaginal exposure in not the fun, not the way that we know CD, we do it in right. a less painful way, but of them actually doing it well. And when it comes to self-compassion, one of the tools we talk about, and this is a very common science-based tool, is to practice writing a compassionate letter to your OCD, right? Or to you, or to your grief, or to your sadness, or your disappointment, whatever it may be. But Just sit down and go, dear me, uh, and really reflect on and and touch on all the experience of that terrible, uncomfortable feeling. I totally, like it might sound like 
I'm so sorry you have to tolerate that high level of discomfort. That must be really hard for you, right? It must take a lot of strength to stay and do ERP, you know, after work, after <laughs> school, right? Um, from now on, when you're doing that, I'd really love to support you. How could I support you? And then you might reflect, like, I really love kind words or um, a reward or whatever it may be. So sometimes just practicing writing it, even though it may feel so weird and awful and icky, can actually spark some of that practice. Yeah. Kimberly, have your children ever angered you? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Hmm. Let me tell you. I, I just had this conversation with my husband today. Is, <laughs> is, uh, the the me here is yeah. not the me up there. <laughs> what, what, why is there such a disparity? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is, that is I'm, I'm so happy to disclose my imperfection in that area. They make and, me crazy. And do you still love them? Deeply. Okay. And, and, and what a great example then of if if other people can anger us and we can still love them could could we do something and still love ourselves mm -hmm. even though we've done something there's your and again yeah yeah both can yeah. be true at the same time absolutely both can be true at the same time right uh, it is it is absolutely possible to be disappointed in and love <laughs> yeah. a decision, a person, what, whatever, whatever it could, could very well be. Yeah. But difficult all at the same time. Easier when we're talking about other people, because again, we are so much nicer to everybody else than we are to ourselves. Well, we can see them as a full person, right? Like, you're yeah. a little this, but a little that. You're a little, you're a little annoying, but you're also really cool, right? Mm -hmm. But when we're in our experience, we tend to zoom in so much, and sometimes we have to zoom out and actually look at the big picture of like I'm more than my thoughts, so much more than my feelings. And yeah, I'm yeah, but so difficult as well too to think, you know, uh, that that was would be the case because uh, the, the notion that this one thing defines me right is is so popular in ocd right you are you are defined by your thoughts you are defined by your images you are defined by your urges you are those things mm -hmm. and of course that's something we're trying to break in in therapy is to recognize you can think anything you want you can have any image that you want whatsoever you know i i have said here people who write horror films come up with some of the most gruesome things in the world and get paid millions of dollars to do it. I remember you telling mm -hmm. me that once yeah. before that stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. And and we celebrate them and and they get awards and everything like that. But if I were to think of that, oh. oh, oh. Right. Un unacceptable. Right. unacceptable. It is a workbook, I believe, your your brand new book. So tell us about like exercises then and, and some of the things that you have people do in there to walk through right. being able to become compassionate towards oneself. Yeah. So um, the book is set out exactly how I actually provide therapy for my clients. So it's a lot of psychoeducation at the beginning about what is OCD and how we get stuck and really then identifying obsessions and compulsions in ways that we punish ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like I really wanted to highlight that that is a compulsion that we engage in, um, you know, often people with OCD more than anybody, right? Um, then we have a whole bunch of exercises. So some we've talked about, letter writing. Um, it might, some of this is very, very science-based coming sure. from mindful self-compassion and compassion-focused therapy. Then we have a whole chapter on meditation that people can practice. Um, the meditations are, I encourage the people to think of them like an experiment just to see what shows up. Again, what equations are showing up for you as you, as you do these. And then the next whole part of the book is what we call self-compassionate ERP, mm -hmm. which is practicing, um, think of it like a sandwich. 
So okay. the meat and cheese is the E and the RP, right? The good okay. stuff, the sustenance is in the middle. But the bread is the compassion, <laughs> right? It's it's making sure that that your exposures are respectful and kind, right? Okay. So you're about to do this hideous thing that you don't want to do, but you're doing it because you value your recovery. Yeah. So how can you practice compassion the whole ride, right? And then the end is all about um, managing strong emotions. Because one thing I found in books that I've read is we don't talk about guilt and shame and grief and all of the emotions that go with it. And so we talk a lot about how to practice compassion around those emotions. Yes, I, I, I will second that. There is there is never enough discussion about the guilt and the shame, you know, and, and like when John Hirschfield and I talk about moral scrupulosity, you know, the, the underlying shame and guilt that goes along in the notion that I might have done some kind of moral transgression toward toward somebody, right? <laughs> right, right. And so again, you know, shame, shame is no joke, right? Like, oh, it's such an exhausting emotion. And it can really penetrate, like I said, our identity and how we see ourselves and how, you know, and so I wanted to make sure um, we kind of got to that. And then also talked about how you can use those skills for in the ERP when that shows up as well. Like I've had clients who say, I don't feel uncertain at all, but I have a lot of guilt and I can't let go of the guilt right now. And so, you know, we talk about that as well. Well, and there was a, a point earlier in the feed, someone talked about, well, I'm doing ERP now and I'm not feeling anxiety. And that can be a trigger for people with OCD because mm -hmm. they say, does that mean now that I am a person who likes these thoughts? And, mm -hmm. and, and the goal of ERP is not to like your thoughts. It's, no. it's really just to not care <laughs> so much about them, right? That, right? Oh, there's that thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know. The goal is whether you have them or not, you still act according to your values and, and treat yourself kindly. Like, so absolutely, absolutely. You know, when, when you have OCD, it's either you fear having the thought or you fear not fearing having the thought, right? It's, it's, it's kind of one or the other. And, right. and, uh, Maybe, you know what, I, I don't know what you think about this, but but I like what you said about and. OCD is all or nothing and non-OCD is and. It, recovery is and. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times. Yeah. Even for me as a human being is I have to be, I go to therapy and I'm like, I have a problem. And I come out of there like the solution is always and. <laughs> you know, it's always and. And I think it's a huge piece of the work that we have to remember because we get so stuck in black and white thinking. I can't move on until I figure this out. You can, you you can move on and be uncomfortable, right? So important. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've been watching the feed at all, but if there's any that stick out for you and you want to jump in on, please uh, scroll it. through. I'm and, looking at your big smile. And <laughs> well, uh, but afraid. if there's, any particulars that, that you want to jump in on. I, I always like to offer our guests that opportunity uh, to, to do such a thing. While we're doing that, could you tell everyone the name of your book again? And I'll even I'll even put it in our little chat here as well. The Self-Compassion Workbook for OCD. So when I, I'll tell you a funny story. It's through a publisher, right? And when I, it's called Lean Into Your Fear, Manage Difficult Emotions and Focus on Recovery. The, the original byline was something to the degree of treat yourself kindly and make fear go away. And I was like, <laughs> no. That's not going to work. No, that is, that is not like, the goal. No. That is unethical sales right yeah. there. So, so it is called lean into your fear, manage difficult emotions, and focus on recovery. Yeah. Yeah, that is, <laughs> that's a much better byline. <laughs> I was just like, no, I think you've got to try again. Like maybe, maybe read the book first. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, let me see. Sure. Um, Go ahead. Take a look. Oh, I love this one. I'd prefer any other type of OCD than the one I have. 
<laughs> which everyone with OCD says. Everybody. Uh, yeah. But I think, again, that a part of self-compassion is common humanity. It's one of the, there's three components to self-compassion. And the middle one is common humanity, which is to recognize that even though your their obsession doesn't seem that painful, they're suffering in exactly the same way you are. It's just that the content is different, mm-hmm. right? So, so compassion is universal. It applies to all thoughts. So even if you have a whack-a-mole type obsession where it w- jumps from one to the other, it doesn't matter. The content doesn't matter. The, the, we can do it. We can practice self-compassion with any. Someone said um, at 5.36 California time, thinking about compassion scares me. If it helps me, maybe I've never had OCD and needed treatment. Maybe I'm lying to myself. How do I convince myself I am deserving of self-compassion? So um, one thing I will share just to sort of make you um, validate you is when I started writing the book, I went onto Instagram and where I had, you know, about 40,000 people at the time. And I did a poll and I said, please just tell me why you don't think you're deserving. And about a thousand people wrote in. And one of the most common, there there are eight that I wrote down and they're all in the book, but one of them was practicing self-compassion will make me snap, right? That's a huge one that it's because compassion, there's a letting go, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lack of hypervigilance that happens when you're practicing compassion and that can trigger your OCD. And then another one, it was simply by having OCD, I'm undeserving. So that was one that folks with OCD said. Um, And then the third was the content of my thoughts disqualify me, right? So you've checked off all of those right there. So I think, again, that's just, I think of it through the lens of that is what OCD does. And so you can, you can first be an observer of that. How do you believe that you're deserving? Catch the equations, right? Because as I said, the clip chart, you're always at the top. You could have every single heinous thought that you could ever come up with. Chances are, Patrick and I have heard them a million times, right? Yeah. <laughs> is, um, there is no clip chart. You don't get clipped down ever. Nothing clips you down. It, I, I do, man, those charts, right? That brings back memories, right? You know, just like instilling fear into people. And and it's interesting. I, I was just speaking to someone the other day and we were talking about her OCD and about how she's really recognizing she's had it her whole life, right? And didn't realize the messages that she heard in grade school that all of the other kids were like, oh, okay, that's a nice little lesson to learn. To her were, well, there's a way to go to hell. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's that's how she she took them that nobody else did. But what the lens of OCD is the worst case scenario lens. You know, no, no one has ever come to see Kimberly or I and said, you know, uh, Kimberly, I'm, I'm really afraid that everybody loves me and thinks I'm awesome. You know, that... <laughs> That has not been a therapy session no, no. for either of us, right? No. no. It no. is it is only the worst case scenario that yeah. we deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, just to speak really quick to the the compassion scaring you, that is that is why we consider it a, a exposure. Right. Um, because it does require you to be uncertain and let go. So I totally get you on that one. Yeah. Any other ones that you thought were interesting? Um, I love how compassionate. You guys are so kind to each other. Mm -hmm. Aren't they great? The support they give each other throughout the chats are wonderful. Exactly. So now it's. Now it's just doing it for yourself. Like you, you're one of my patients says it's really hard for her to think of like how she would treat herself. Like. She said, that's very hard for me to wrap my head around. But she says, I can't imagine how my friend would treat me. Mm -hmm. Right. Like so that, you know, just think about like how would one of my people in the chat speak to me if I said this. Right. Um, And someone said, my OCD is telling me I don't deserve your kindness. Mm -hmm. OCD has a trick for everything like the like the um, football you were talking about. Yeah, there's. 
I, I've never won a discussion with OCD because I, I've talked about there's OCD logic and there's non OCD logic. And OCD logic always has one more yeah, but what if than yeah. regular logic does. Right. Are you sure? Yeah. So OCD gets yeah. together. Are you sure? Yeah. And yeah. it's done. <laughs> I, I've said to people who have religious scrupulosity, your God or higher power themselves could show up next to you and say, hey, we're good. And you would go, are you? Are you sure about that? <laughs> but does he know all the details, Tom? Do, do you really does know he, everything does he that I've that thought? one <laughs> Even? Yeah, right. Right, yeah. right? No, exactly <laughs> it, right? Um, yeah. So again, just keep throwing the, the flip, the clip shot out. Just keep, and keep being aware of that. Um, mm. This one's interesting too, Kelsey. This part. I feel like I deliberately choose to think these things. Mm -hmm. And there's, to me, there's another great OCD trick. Oh, well, yeah. you, you wouldn't have thought this if you didn't want to think of it, right? Mm -hmm. which, right? Which once I tell you, everyone knows what's coming. Don't think of a pink elephant, right? The moment, the moment you're told not to think of the pink elephant, then you, you can't think of anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So is it, is it that you deliberately thought it or is it that OCD led you to think it by telling you not to think? It? Yeah. Yeah. And then ultimate exposure is to deliberately think about it and to be kind. Yeah. Like that's a double whammy. It's like a double, double, double whammy. Wait, double you want whammy. me to think this thing and not yeah. punish myself for it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Think about the, the, I always sort of think about like, um, points right so OCD gets points if it gets you to do something you get points if you don't like if you thought of the thought on purpose and you were kind you get two points for that. like wow. that's a win mm -hmm. that's yeah. zero points for OCD and two for you like that's winning right so always throw on the compassion piece in whatever respect you can for double points yeah, yeah. There's even a bonus point almost, it feels like, for compassion there in that yeah. kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. It is nice to watch everybody on here be supportive of each other. And if they, I, I couldn't agree with you more, if people could only be as nice to themselves as they are to everybody else on the chat, we, you and I wouldn't have to have jobs after a while, right? Oh, I wouldn't because... have to have written a book. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have to sit in quarantine in a hotel in Sydney for two weeks finishing the stupid it's thing, true, right? It's true. It's true. It's <laughs> true. Although I did write it during the quarantine, and I have to say, it was helpful for me as a yeah. human to just, you know, again, I won't really want to stress here. This isn't just for OCD. This is a life skill. If you've practiced these, you'll actually have all these extra tools to manage just life in general, right? These are life skills. So, you know, yeah. for the win. Well, the tools of OCD are guilt and shame and disgust and stress and anxiety and discomfort uh, un yeah totally uncertainty these are the things that ocd loves you know uh you you are from australia so i've been actually using an australia example lately uh, you know koalas are like ocd because koalas eat one thing right what do they eat eucalyptus leaves OCD eats one thing, compulsions. Compulsions. So the OCD is the koala of of things, right? They they are sim they they share a common bond. They only eat that's, each only eat one thing. That's so ironic because koalas spit. Yeah. <laughs> They spit on you. They're pretty Everyone's nasty. Like, I love actually. koalas, and I'm like, oh, my koalas be spit. <laughs> OCD spits too. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. Spits out all sorts of negativity all the time. So uh, you can use that, my Australian friend, as the OCD is the koala of the mental health world. It, it, is. it eats one thing and one thing only. Compulsions are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We starve it from its, its one food. And that's what we have to do. We got to starve it from its food. And how do we do that? By exposure and response prevention and the response prevention is so key and i love what you said wrapped in the bread of self-compassion mm -hmm. which me. means you do it before you do your exposures you do it during your exposures and after some people think that they only have to do it like at one time try to, try yeah. to just mess it all up in there yeah. keep it going keep it going the whole way through so so very important well kimberly quinlan 
uh, tell everyone a little bit about where they can find you on like your Instagram or things if they want. And uh, we'll wrap it up here. <laughs> Sure, yeah. So um, you can find me on Instagram at Kimberly Quinlan, um, or um, we're actually going to change the name of it. So you can type in Kimberly Quinlan and you'll get me. But if you also like to listen, we have a free podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit. Um, and we have online courses for people with BFRBs, hair pulling and OCD and it's at cbtschool.com. We also have a bunch of free stuff there as well. Um, and that's where you'll find me. That's awesome. Well, as always, it has been a pleasure to have a guest. I love having guests. And Kimberly, so good to see you again. I'm so happy to see you. And thank you guys for having me. All right. Everyone have a great night tonight. We'll see you next week.